Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Welcome, Walter. Welcome to you too. Thank you. I what are we doing now? Well, we're discussing some questions again. And uh, I like the topics that the people ask. So like last time we had a nice Bible study on Romans 3. Let's see what this brings up. Let's see where we go. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you again for bringing us together. We again ask you to bless our minds with the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit and then also our viewers. In Jesus' name, Amen. As we said last time, questions are very, very important. You know, when I was at university, students would sometimes be embarrassed to ask questions. Because, you know, some people would mock <laughs> yeah, and yeah. tease them, etc. But I was always of the opinion there is no such thing as an irrelevant question. A question is something that requires an answer. Yeah. And uh, may the Lord help us, according to the best of our abilities, to provide answers when there are problems. And if we do not know, then we must say, we, we don't, don't know. know. Is there someone who can help us? Exactly. I think uh, I've somewhere heard that the only stupid question is the question not asked. Correct. That's a very good way of putting it. So here is a question that has been presented to us. There's a verse in the Bible that says, when Jesus died, he went to preach to those who died in the time of Noah. What does this mean? You see... In the creeds of the churches, we have the statement, he ascended into hell. Mm -hmm. But of course, this word in, in the Bible, hell, is actually grave. Yeah. So if you have a different concept of hell as a place where those who do not die in a right standing with God go to after death, then you can develop this confusion and there are some verses which seem to indicate that uh, that is the way you should interpret it. So the verses they're referring to here are in 1 Peter chapter 3. And let's just read what they say here. For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. There you have the plan of salvation again that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So this is just a statement that Christ died for our sins, that he rose again from the dead. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few that his eight souls were saved. Now let's analyze this carefully. He's referring to the Spirit. He was quickened by the Spirit. He rose from the dead, right? Now, by the same Spirit, he also preached unto the spirits that are in prison. Now the Bible calls the grave a prison. Oh, yes. So these people are now dead and the Holy Spirit was once active amongst those people as well, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing. Now the question here is, mm -hmm. Did God, by his Holy Spirit, work in those children of disobedience in the times of Noah? Yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. So let's read this in this fashion. So this Spirit, this Holy Spirit, was also active in the time of Noah. These people are now dead, but in the time of Noah the Spirit worked with them as He is working with us today. While the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So basically all this verse says is that the same Holy Spirit mm -hmm. that is working in us, worked in days past, 
who were those that are now dead, but that lived in the time of Noah. It's not saying that Jesus went to a place called hell, hell and spoke to those people over there. It's really quite simple. Yeah. If you know that the word Hades means grave, mm -hmm. then this confusion would not exist. So basically, what has brought about the confusion? The doctrines of the churches. Great. And where did they get that doctrine from? From Rome. Oh. How do we justify our belief that man cannot forgive sins in light of John 20, verse 21 to 23? Well, basically these verses say, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Mm. So let's just go to some Bible verses to get some clarity here. Luke chapter 5 verse 21 says, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? In other words, it was common knowledge in those days that God alone forgives sins. Yes. And because Jesus had said to that person that he healed, Your sins are forgiven, this was considered blasphemy. So the, the bottom line is only God can forgive sins. So in the light of that, we have to interpret the other verses. Paul also addresses this issue and he says, Do you not know that we will judge angels? Mm. Is it therefore not possible for you to judge the simple things that happen in a church? So basically what Jesus was saying, that if the church judges a simple matter, let's say a man is caught in adultery, yeah. then the church has the right to judge the matter and to say this individual is placed under censure because he has transgressed the law. And if he doesn't make this right and if he doesn't uh, apologize, and come back into harmony with the principles of God, he stays excluded. Let's say he moved in with someone mm -hmm. while he was married. Then he's living in transgression. And the church, knowing the standards, says, excuse me, you are under censure. And then if he makes matters right and he repents, then the church will take him back. So God will acknowledge that censure as a right act. It doesn't mean that the sin of that individual is forgiven by the church. No. It means that they have the capacity to judge an issue and to make recommendations based on the principles of God's law. That's yes. all it means. Mm. Please establish a strong argument for the doctrine of investigative judgment from the Bible only. There are many people that say that uh, the Adventists have it wrong when they talk about an investigative judgment. The words investigative judgment do not appear in the Bible. Mm -mm. But that doesn't mean that the principle of an investigative judgment does not appear in the Bible. Yeah. Any, any court of law has various phases mm -hmm. of activity. When a case is brought before a judge, there is first a discussion as to whether the person is guilty or not. Mm. In other words, there's an investigation. Yes. Right? You might not call it that, but that is actually what takes place. That's what a court case is all about. And once that investigation has been carried out, then there can come a pronouncement of judgment. And after the pronouncement of judgment, there is an execution of that judgment. In other words, you have an investigation, you have a pronouncement, and you have yes. an execution of judgment, executive judgment. Those are the phases of judgment. So what about the Bible? Does it speak about these issues in any way? So let's look at it carefully. Firstly, there is a judgment in the Bible. 
We know that. You can find it in the New Testament. You can find it in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And it's very consistent. So there is a judgment. Let's read a few verses. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it will be evil. So there will be a judgment, right? Definitely. And who is the one who's doing the judging here? God. God. Secondly, the judgment is for all men. Romans 14 verse 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. All judgment has been handed over to Christ. Yeah. In a very interesting sense, Christ himself is also being judged. Yeah. Because there was a war in heaven. And Satan accused the government of God. Mm -hmm. In other words, he accused Jesus Christ of unfair practice by eliminating him from heaven and yet providing redemption for Adam and Eve. Yes. So Christ and his righteousness, his correct doing, are also, in a sense, being judged. Now the third point is the judgment will be for the righteous and the wicked. Mm. Ecclesiastes 3.17 I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time, therefore every purpose and for every work. So there will be the righteous yeah. and there will be the wicked. Jesus refers to the sheep and the, the goats. goats. The good fish and the bad fish. That there will be a separation. Mm. So we have established there is a judgment. judgment. The judgment will be for the just and for the wicked. Nobody is excluded. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And Paul makes it quite clear. You cannot, as a human, determine the motives of the heart. Mm -hmm. Leave that to God. to God. Leave that to God. Now the fourth point is, there will be an investigation for the books of record are to be opened. Right? Yes. Daniel chapter 7 verse 10. Well, you know, we can read it here, but we can also go to the Bible. Correct. I always like going to the Bible directly. And we can look at the book of Daniel. And we can go to Daniel chapter 7. And in, interesting, in chapter 7, he describes these creatures, these beasts that arise, these kingdoms that will arise. Mm -hmm. And from verse 9, we have a new paragraph. And it says, I beheld till thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand, thousands ministered unto him and ten thousand times thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. Now Martin, where does this scene take place? In heaven. It takes place in heaven. And books are being opened. Yep. Now, what books are these? There are various books mentioned in the Bible. Mm -hmm. There is the Book of Life. Yes. And, uh, by the way, who is written in the Book of Life? Every person. Every single person is written in the Book of Life. So Christ died for all. Yes. But can you your name be removed from the book of life. Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, yes. And that will be based upon what? Your acts, your, your deeds, deeds, and your decisions. Yes. Right? 
I beheld, then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and the body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So while this scene is taking place in heaven, there are great words being spoken down here. Mm -hmm. And he looks through the stream of time, even to the point where that entity will be destroyed. Yes. So basically... Daniel 7 tells us about a judgment scene which takes place in heaven mm -hmm. and books are being opened. Now, what would be the purpose of opening books? To glance at it and look at it, read it, see what's going on in there. And to investigate yes, whether investigate. someone is uh, in the book of life or not in the book of life. Yes. Are there deeds of such a nature that they will not be scratched out of the book of life. Did they have faith, etc.? So Luke chapter 21 verse 36 says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you might be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So in other words, the time will come when you will stand before the Son of Man and give an account. Mm -hmm. But the books have already been studied in heaven prior to that. Prior to that. Okay. The fifth point is, there will be a pronouncement of the verdict. So there must be an investigation. The mm -hmm. books were opened. And uh, take care of how you live your life because eventually you will confront Christ himself and you will be confronted with whatever has been determined from that investigation. And then there will be a pronouncement of, of a verdict. verdict. And some people will say, when they hear the verdict, but Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these wonderful things in your name? In your name? And he will say, depart from me. And then there's an interesting word there, ye that practice anomia. Mm -hmm against the law of God. And we must not forget that. So Revelation 22 verse 11 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. In other words, when that investigation has come to an end for all of humanity, yes. then God initiates the cutoff point. And he says, from now on, those that were unjust, let them be unjust still. Those that were righteous, let them be righteous still. And if you are holy, you will remain holy. If you are unholy, you will remain unholy. In other words, probation is closed. So that is a final close to the entire judgment scene. Revelation 22 verse 12 says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. So here's my question. He says he's coming quickly and he brings his reward with him. What is that reward? Well, it will be either eternal life or eternal judgment. Okay. It's the, it's the verdict of the, of the whole investigative judgment. Okay. So this decision must take place when? In prior? Heaven. Yes, prior. Or after his yeah. coming? Before. Otherwise he cannot bring his reward with he him, Can't right? come with the reward, yeah. So obviously there is this investigation and the pronouncement of, of the close of probation and then when he comes his reward will be with him now in the resurrection mm -hmm. is there more than one resurrection yes yes you have the resurrection of the just mm -hmm. and the rest of the dead did not wake up right Correct. that says the bible and they remained in the graves how long a thousand a years. thousand years so only if you are part of the first resurrection are you part of the resurrection of the redeemed. Mm. If you're part of the second resurrection, then that is very bad news. It means that you are eternally lost. The sixth point is there will be an executive judgment. 
So we've gone through the phases. Revelation 20 verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, this is after the millennium. This is the second resurrection. Yes. So here you have this great white throne, the dead, the unrighteous dead are raised and they face the consequences of their actions. And if they were not found written in the book, they were cast into the lake of fire. Now, verse 14 had defined that lake of fire. Mm -hmm. And if we read verse 14, it says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Yes. So that is the final destruction of the wicked, the second death from which there is no resurrection. The seventh point we would like to mention is there will be a clearing of the righteous. Mm -hmm. You have to be cleared of your transgression because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So Hebrews 12 verse 23 tells us, To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So he's referring to the church and he said, here are individuals that are no longer unrighteous but have now been Come. declared righteous. Mm -hmm. Now we have to be very careful how we study this. So point eight that we want to mention is there will be an accounting worthy of the righteous before the second coming of Christ. It must take place before yes. the second coming of Christ because otherwise there couldn't be a reward and a resurrection of the just because they must have been de declared Correct. just, right? Otherwise, or, you would have had to bring up all and then declare it and the rest would have correct. to die. Correct, and that's not how it happens. No. There's only a resurrection of those that died in Christ. And they are accounted worthy. It's important that we study this carefully. Now Luke chapter 20 from verse 34 onwards says, And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now, we're not using this verse to talk about marriage and what marriage will be like in heaven. It's simply about being accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead. So they must have been accounted worthy. Yes. Now, what does that mean? That means it must have been a study to see if you are worthy. Yes, there must have been an investigation yeah. to see if you are worthy. So... This accounting worthy, verse 36 says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. In the investigation, you have to be accounted worthy. Otherwise, you cannot be part of the first resurrection. Correct. So let's look at this word, accounted worthy. What is it in the Bible? The word is kataxiu. And this is the concordance, Strong's, to deem entirely deserving, to count worthy. Now, according to Moulton and Milligan, this Greek word does not mean to make worthy, but to count worthy. And here is again a difference between Catholicism and Protestantism. Catholicism teaches that you are made worthy. Protestant teaching is that you are counted worthy. In other words, it is the imputed yes. and imparted 
righteousness which you appropriate by faith mm -hmm. which makes you counted, counted as worthy so the gift is always a gift from the giver and not something that you eventually attain it is an imputed and imparted alien righteousness so that no man can boast Correct. so i hope that this answers the question of whether there is an investigation or whether there is not an investigation and it hopefully also answers that that investigative judgment is prior to Jesus' second coming. It has to be. Otherwise, there could be no resurrection of the just and an ignoring of the unjust. Correct. Is Satan's personification of Jesus' second coming happening before or after the close of probation? Is there any point in deceiving people after the close of probation? No. No. So any form of deception that takes place whereby you induce people to follow a particular teaching must take place prior to the close of probation. So Satan's uh, masquerading as the angel of light will take place before the close of probation. And he will use words of Christ himself yes. to lead people away from the truth and the law of God and bring across his point of view and people will be deceived by it. But those who know their Bible will know that Jesus Christ will not come in this way. Correct. Number one, the Bible tells us that the righteous will meet him in the sky. In other words, he will not touch this earth with yes. his feet. Whereas this imposter will be visible in city to city walking upon the ground. Mm. And his words will be contrary to the word of God. He will, for example, say that the Sabbath has been changed. But there's no statement in the Bible that that is the case. Yeah. And not to be um, taken lightly, you will do it in a way that will be very hard to distinguish you have to be grounded and anchored in the word. Absolutely. He is a master of deception and he was a liar from the beginning. What does it mean to walk in the spirit? Galatians 5 verse 16. Well, in Colossians 1 verse 27 we read, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In other words, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? To have Christ in you. It means to have Christ in you. And who works the good works when Christ is in you? Him. It is Christ working in you that is the hope of glory. Now, can Christ be in disharmony with his own teachings? No. So in other words, what is the criterion to determine whether someone is walking in the Spirit or not? If he's keeping the law and walking according to the Bible. Walking according to the Bible and doing what the Bible says because that is what Christ came to do. He was the embodiment of the law. So in other words, if you want to know whether somebody is justified or not and whether he's walking in the Spirit, you have to ask yourself, like James says, if the works are not in accordance mm -hmm. with the Spirit, then you are not walking according to the Spirit. And the Bible makes it quite clear in Acts chapter 5 that God gives His Holy Spirit to them that obey Him. Correct. So there you have the criteria as to whether someone is walking in the Spirit. Or not. By the fruits mm -hmm. you will know them. Obedience without love and faith is also worthless. It's totally worthless. How do you, didn't you once say it's not uh, good people that go to heaven, it it's obedient, obedient people, people that go to heaven. And people don't like that statement because it sounds like a legalistic. Yes. But did Jesus say that if you love me, 
keep my commandments. Is that obedience? That's obedience. So do you show love by obedience? The, the other thing, of course, is what is your motive yes. for keeping the commandments? Is it fear? Then fear will work. not get you to heaven. No. So what is the motive? Is, is it love? If you love That's me, keep my commandments. Th that means you must have so studied yourself into this, into this argument that you eventually see it from the point of view that God sees exactly. it. Exactly. You must not have the faith alone in Jesus. You must have the faith of, of Jesus. Jesus. And he says, I have kept my father's commandments. Yes. Therefore, when you study the commandments and you internalize them and you see that they are perfectly logical and absolutely necessary for peace and harmony and love to flourish, then it's no longer a command, but it is an act of love to Amen. keep them. Amen. There is a 40-year period between the plagues and the exodus and the claiming of the promised land. During that period, the Israelites were a terribly stiff-necked people who defied the Lord who was among them. Can you please address the antitype of that period? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Now, I actually did a whole series on that once. It's called Total Transformation. Right. Perhaps you can put a link in I will. to that. Uh, let's put it mildly. Whatever the Israelites did when they were the stiff-necked people, mm -hmm. we've improved upon it. Yes. <laughs> God's people true. today are no less stiff-necked than were the Israelites of old. Definitely. No matter what aspect you touch, Take diet, for example. Yeah. They were craving the flesh pots of Egypt. Modern Israel, God's people today, crave the flesh pots of Egypt. Uh, There's that nice word, murmuring. Murmuring, we are idolatry. We have so many idols. They just take a different form. Yes. And uh, yes, I think people should perhaps take some time and look at that series. What's important for me on that series is it's the story of the Bible. If you have all this knowledge, but there's no transformation, yes, then it's worth nothing. It's not enough to have a head knowledge of the plan of salvation. You can quote every single verse in the Bible. The devil is very good at quoting verses in the Bible. Yes. But if it's not applied to the heart, then it's not the balm of Gilead. Correct. So, yes, there is a stiff-necked people living today. Yeah, there's an antitype is alive and well. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, who are we to say, well, they are the stiff-necked ones. There are many, many aspects in our lives in where we life. qualify perfectly as a stiff-necked people. <laughs> Correct. Yes. Please would you talk about the second great exodus and how close do you think we are to it? Well, what was the first exodus all about? It was a salvation from physical slavery, mm. bondage. What is the second great exodus? It is a salvation from spiritual bondage, mm. bondage to sin. So there is an exodus which takes place in your personal life. When you accept the gospel, then there is an exodus from the bondage of sin into the salvation which is offered to you by Christ. That takes place on an individual level. But then you also have a corporate salvation. Yeah. Just as the Israelites as a nation were taken out of the bondage of Egypt, which served as a type mm -hmm. for God's people at the end to come out of that bondage, come out of Babylon, in other words, the bondage of sin. Babylon is confusion yes. and syncretism and mixing truth and, and error. error yeah. and 
God says, come out of that mess because it has become a house of demons, a house of every unclean and detestable bird. There's a false Holy Spirit mm -hmm. leading you into rebellion against God's law rather in, than into harmony with God's law. And come out so that you do not partake of her plagues and do not come into judgment. And judgment has a basis, as we discussed in yes. our previous WhatsApp, which is the law. Yes, transgression of it. Come out of her, my people. Mm -hmm. And in that final call, just before the close of probation, mm -hmm. we as a people of God are basically at Baal Peor. Yeah. On that great moment, when that final apostasy takes place even within the church mm -hmm. and there is a separation, a shaking from even within the church and after that they went into Canaan. So God's people will go into the heavenly Canaan once that probation has closed, the plagues have fallen and Christ comes to fetch his people. Mm -hmm. So. so there's an individual and a corporate exodus. And how close do you think we are to it? Even at the door. Didn't we have one like that? Amen. And then there was a statement that I thought was very beautiful that we can maybe just discuss a little bit. Righteousness by faith is the headline. And this person said, my wife and I, have been reading through the great controversy lately and I just realized that there is a constant thread of righteousness by faith that you can follow all the way from Adam, Eve, Cain and Abel through the dark ages, the reformation, all the way down to today. This has been the most viciously attacked subject by Satan throughout every age. Absolutely spot on. Righteousness by faith is contrary to the human nature. We do not want to acknowledge our helpless state. We want to be able to contribute to our salvation. But a dead person, as we said, cannot contribute anything. Yeah. Righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity. So yes, it says, do not accept the mark of the beast. Do not conform to his law, which is contrary to God's law, because righteousness is made manifest by obedience to God's commandments, right? Yes. Not as a means to salvation, no. but as a consequence of salvation. All our righteousness is filthy rags. And this beautiful truth, that the God of heaven should condescend to come and take the place of a sinner dead in transgression, take the stripes that should be on me unto himself, pay that price, and then offer that eternal life back to me on the condition of righteousness by faith, and faith alone, not by works, so that I cannot boast in anything but the righteousness of Christ. Yes. That's the beauty of salvation. That's the biblical message. And that is a message that most of the world does not want to accept. And to my horror, the Protestant world has compromised that doctrine in the joint declaration mm. of justification. Because now, as you know, it reads that we are saved by grace alone and not faith alone, mm -hmm. and by Christ's saving works, works and not by his atoning blood, and that Protestants should put their pen to paper is mind-boggling to me. Righteousness by faith does not negate, like we've said before, keeping the law. Correct. Isn't there in Hebrews the whole story about Abraham that kept his faith? But also the Bible tells us that Abraham kept the commandments. Okay, let's go to that verse. I think it's Genesis chapter 26. And it's verse 5. 
5, where it says, Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Mm. So if Abraham was saved by faith alone, then what commandments and statutes and laws did he keep here? So his faith was made perfect by works, as okay. Jude says. And if we go to the book of Hebrews... And just before we go there, I just want to mention, uh, this is before Sinai. Oh, yes. So it's not the same law that Moses gave to the Israelites. No, no. It, oh, I'm so sorry. It is the same law, but it means it's been applicable before it was given spoken correct we know that the law was there before because uh, when he took them out of egypt he said i will test them whether they will walk according to my law or not and the manna fell as you know in such a way that the sabbath was made prominent again before yes they came to mount sinai now when we go to the book of hebrews And in the first chapter, it tells us exactly who Jesus is. Mm. It's, a, it's a beautiful chapter. It's probably one of the most marvelously written chapters in the Bible. It has so much depth. I think in a future episode, maybe you can work us through of the book of Hebrews a little bit. Maybe we should go through the book of Hebrews. But the first chapter tells us who Jesus is. The first chapter tells us that he is the creator, that he, mm -hmm. is, uh, he is the exalted Son of God. To which of the angels in verse 13 said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs to, of salvation? The exalted nature of the Son of God is brought out in chapter 1. We won't go into the details at this moment. And uh, if we go to chapter 2, then it tells us about this great salvation. Verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Salvation is, is the study of eternity which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. That's the disciples. They confirmed it. And if you go to verse 10, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So Jesus went through suffering because of us. Verse 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. And then in verse 15 he brings us to Abraham. And he says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. In other words, he became fully human to identify himself yeah. with humanity and paid the price for humanity. Now it's a sad thing that many modern translations pervert verse 16 and will say, Surely it is not angels that he helps. <laughs> but this translation here in the King James is so spot on. For verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And then when we go to the great chapter of faith, which is chapter 11, and we've spoken about this many, many times, and I've spoken about this many times and I think you can preach unlimited sermons on the first verse. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
And I've always said that this is the most ridiculous verse in the Bible if you take it at face value. Correct. But it is the most important verse in the Bible because verse 6 says, without faith it is impossible to please him. So if faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, then faith is something that by definition is not based on what you see. No. It's based on what you believe. Mm. I always use the example of a court of justice and the judge calls the witness to the front and says, please tell us what you saw in this case. Give us your witness. And the witness says, uh, Your Honor, this is what I did not see. Then what would the judge say? Sorry. <laughs> Excuse me, what are you doing here? You're wasting the court's time, right? And how can something that you hope for have substance? Mm. You cannot hope for something and that has substance at the same time because substance implies that the thing that you are hoping for is really there, is a reality. You cannot hope to be driving a Ferrari and uh, then have the substance at the same time. You cannot climb into the hope and put your foot down yeah. and feel the difference, right? Correct. No. So faith is something that is based on something that you know will happen, but it has not happened, happened yet. yet. Mm. Didn't you also say that once we are in heaven, you won't need faith anymore because you have got the substance? So faith is the substance of things hoped for. I hope for eternal life. And this hope must be so real that it actually has substance for you. It must be tangible. You must be living in that hope already. And how do you attain to this hope? By faith. And where do you get it? From Christ. Correct. You have to appropriate his righteousness. And by faith you must assume that he has parted it and mm -hmm. imputed to it and your friends will have to say what happened to you you totally changed i don't know you anymore there must be a change the transformation without the transformation there's no evidence at all that you know christ mm -hmm. right for by it the elders obtained a good report through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of god so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In other words, ex nihilo. He spoke and it stood fast. Do you believe that? Yes. Well, the scientific world has to believe it yeah, because the well, scientific world says the, the Big, Big Bang, Bang came out of nothing. Came out of nothing. So they believe that yeah. and they ridicule those that believe what the Bible says. When they're own premise is as ridiculous. It's actually also a faith. It's a faith. It's not science, not at all. And they're trying to peddle it as science. Mm -hmm. In fact. I have no problem with science. No. But I have a problem with the philosophy of science. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And this is what this question pertains to. They've got Adam in there, they've got Eve, and they've got Cain and Abel in there. And the Bible clearly tells us that the sacrifice of Abel was more excellent than the sacrifice of Cain. Why? Because of his heart and obedience. And he was appropriating a righteousness which was outside of himself. He said, the lamb which I am yes. offering is my substitute. Yeah. Righteousness he by faith. He didn't um, rely on himself. He relied on an external source. Exactly. And he was saved by the blood of that lamb. Mm. And what did Cain bring? The works of his hands. The works of his hands. And which one was more excellent? Abel's was the correct one. Okay. Now, in the world today, do we have these two religious systems side by side? Yes. And did you know that only Protestantism only Protestantism, which is a fraction 
of the world's religions, a tiny little yeah. fraction, even within Christianity it is a fraction, appropriates the righteousness of Christ, as Abel did, and the rest of the world have a sacrifice of works. Yes. Which is a very sad thing, right? Yes. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So here you have the whole question of death and resurrection, which is also negated by the world today. Yes. They say that when you die, you go directly to heaven. Mm. But here it clearly states that Enoch was translated alive to heaven. Everybody else dies and has to wait till the resurrection. Yes. The world doesn't believe that. No. So does it have the faith of Jesus? No. No, you have to believe what the Bible says in exactly. order to appropriate this faith. Because without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Righteousness by faith is the heart of salvation. Mm -hmm. And even within the ranks of believers, you have the battle between the way of Cain and the way of Abel. It will rage until the final moments of earth's history. Righteousness by faith is the heart of the third angel's message. By faith, Noah... We don't even have to go further than that. No. You built an ark, right? Correct. Does the world believe that today? No. No. Do they have faith? <laughs> no. So without faith it is impossible to please him. Do they please God by their evolutionary ideas and the denial of a universal flood? No. No. Not at all. And then this verse that you were referring to. By faith Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. So what did he do with his faith? He acted upon it. And obeyed. And did he receive the promise there and then? No. No, he was a stranger and he sojourned among strangers. Exactly. And even when it came to a burial place, did he... Did he receive it as a gift or did he buy it? He had to buy it. He bought, it was offered to him as yeah, a gift, but, he, said but no. he bought it. He bought it. So he, none of these had received the promise. And uh, we can carry on and say, By faith he sojourned in a land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Not of the substance, but by faith they had the substance even though they didn't actually feel it. For he looked for a city, and here's another point. He looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Mm -hmm. Now, is there a city in heaven where mm -hmm. God is the architect and the builder? Yes. Is this according to the Bible? Yes. Does the book of Revelation tell us that there will be a new Jerusalem which will come down from heaven dressed like a bride? Correct. The city of God. Do people believe that? No. They want an earthly kingdom. They want an earthly kingdom. But we want a heavenly kingdom, right? Yes. So let's go back to that, that verse in John chapter 14. I mean, we've read it so many times, it's unbelievable. But uh, this is the heart of the matter. And we must know this one off by heart. Let not your hearts be troubled. Amen. Ye believe. Now there's that little word, right? Mm -hmm. Believe. In God, believe also in me, in my Father's house, so many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Is this a real place or is this a ghostly place? No, it's a real place. Whose maker and builder is God. Is God. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. What is the way? The truth and the life, Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So righteousness by faith is the only way to appropriate salvation and to be heirs of the promise. And out of your faith, your obedience flows. One last verse. While it springs to mind, go to Isaiah chapter 58. Have you got it? Yes. And let's go to verse 13. And read verse 13 and 14. The last two verses of Isaiah 58. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then. Mm -hmm. That's a very important word. Then, after all these things, shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. What is the heritage of Jacob? Eternal life. That is the heritage of Jacob. And the promise was that he would inherit Canaan. Yes. And that was a typical Canaan. And here we're referring, of course, to the anti-typical Canaan. Mm -hmm. So another question. Does the Sabbath play a pivotal role in the faith question? Yes. Let's just, let's just recap. Did the world or does the world believe in the story of Noah as told in the Bible? No. No. No, we actually saw it's a conspiracy. Correct. So do they believe in the creation account? No. That's the very first no, statement don't. in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, that the world was framed, mm -hmm. right? You have to believe that. What's the symbol of that? The, the Sabbath. So if you keep the Sabbath, is that works or is that an acknowledgement mm -hmm. of a completed work that Christ has already performed in creation and redemption? Exactly. That's an acknowledgement. It's part of righteousness by faith. You cannot separate it. You cannot separate it. So may God give us wisdom as we separate salvation by works mm. from salvation by faith. And as we look at the Sabbath as the great memorial of your faith in that creation and that redemption. May God give us wisdom. Let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, your book is so full of wisdom that needs to be tapped. And I pray that the Holy Spirit may enlighten our minds and minds of readers, that they may understand the depth and the length and the breadth of your word, which is unto salvation. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe to our channel, click here. To get notifications, click on the bell. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you, and we'll see you again.